We find our Lord today at the beach. And yes, even at the beach, along the lakeside, he finds an opportunity to preach and teach the crowds about the meaning of life. But as Jesus also acknowledges in today's gospel, even if you're trying to preach to people about the greatest truths of all, even if you're trying to speak to people about the pathway to joy, even there you can experience a tough crowd, disengaged, disinterested, and indifferent. And perhaps, you know, we find that a bit shocking, maybe, at least on the surface. You know, disengaged, disinterested, and indifferent to the greatest truths of all. Indifferent to the words of the creator of the universe. You know, if someone's speaking, you know, and it's God, the creator of the universe, you'd think perhaps you might want to listen. All I can say is, on the one hand, we might say, well, you know, it's a bit sad. It's a bit sad that even the creator of the universe has a tough crowd. But on the other hand, I sort of sigh an air of relief. You know, if they didn't listen to Christ, you know, what hope do I have? You know, I don't take it too personally that when people don't listen to me, or perhaps you find the same thing. So as our Lord explains, that's why he speaks in parables. Our Lord tells stories hoping that this will be the way that he might be able to help them to understand that what he's got to say is for love and for truth and ultimately for their salvation. I just speak loudly. But what I really appreciate about this gospel is how our Lord takes this opportunity to unravel what is really a profound mystery of life. At least to me it's a profound mystery, perhaps to you. And, and the mystery is this, why is it that some people hear the gospel and fall madly in love with God. And others hear the same gospel, the same gospel, and yet they run away almost in fear. And, you know, this is how, when we're thinking about how to evangelize our culture, you know, it's very easy for us to lament all the difficulties and struggles. You know, oh, no one comes, or you know, oh, the numbers are down and no one's interested, you know, it's the issue of secularism or, you know, all the ideological agendas against the church, that's the problem, or, you know, or it's the problem of the clergy or, you know, all the bishops are bad or, you know, we can come up with a litany of reasons as to why we think people might be disengaged, disinterested and indifferent to the gospel. But what our Lord does today is he kind of draws our attention back to what is actually the, at the root of the problem. And the problem is not really out there. The problem is here. It's the problem of the human heart. My heart. Everyone's heart. So what Jesus goes on to explain, he says, well, the reason I tell stories is to try and capture people's hearts. Because these are hearts, he says, that have become almost incapable to understanding. Understanding the most beautiful things of life. And note here, when he says, I want them to understand the meaning of life, he's not saying, look, I'm trying to teach them to understand, you know, a complex mathematical problem, or let's, let's try to help them to understand, you know, a really sophisticated scientific theorem, or let's try and help the people to understand, you know, the deeper profundities of a great metaphysical dilemma. He's trying to help them to understand the very meaning of their existence. You know, no one could be indifferent, no one should be disinterested in the meaning of their existence and trying to understand that. And so when you think about it, again, it's quite shocking. But actually our Lord says, no, 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 this is to be expected. It's to be expected that there's people going to hear the gospel and not understand or understand it to various degrees. And that's why he quotes from the prophet Isaiah. He says, well, the, quoting the prophet Isaiah, our Lord recounts that the heart of this nation, he says, the heart of this nation has grown coarse. Their ears are dull of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. For fear they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts. They fear to be converted by me and healed by me. Again, that word fear resurfaces again and again and again through the Gospels, and we should not underestimate that. People fear 
Fear the truth. Fear that reality. And you know, I think when you spend enough time in a parish, you can really resonate with this gospel, you know? And you can think, you know, you know, when our Lord is sort of saying to you, know, imagine, imagine the sower going out to sow, you can sort of imagine, imagine the sower going down to Cronulla Beach. Huh? Tough crowd, Cronulla Beach on a Saturday, and you try to preach about the greatest truths of life. I guarantee it's going to be a tough crowd. Huh? And so you're trying to sow the seeds of faith at Cronulla Beach. And you think about, all right, you try to think, well, where do all these people fit in? And you think about your own parish, and you want to put people in boxes a little bit, you know, trying to make it neat. And you say, well, the seed that falls on the edge of the path, you know, maybe that's sort of those that come and get baptized and then you never see again. You know, immediately the worries of the world carry them off. Then the, the seed that falls on the patches of rock, you know, there's a little bit of soil there, but, it, but a little bit of energy and they spring up. Well, maybe that's a bit like how a lot of people come back for the sacramental programs. There's a little bit of energy and then it withers away very, very quickly because there's no real roots there, no real foundations. Then when we think about the seed that falls in the thorns, well, I'm sure you and, you and I both know of people that we thought were committed Catholics. We'll go to Mass, and then all of a sudden, you know, the lures of the world, you know, not like, I don't have time to come to church anymore, I'm too busy. All the worries of the world begin to choke the faith. And that plant, that seed is, is diminished and atrophied. And then finally, you know, you think about the seed that falls on the rich soil. You know, the seed that falls in the richness of the truth of the gospel. There, that's the soil that produces the salvation of souls, you know. That's the, that's the crop that reaches out to others. Rich soil allows for deep roots. Now, as I said, truth be told... And I think the reality is we're all in, in life, we're all at various stages. And we kind of vary between those different patches of soil, if you like. And I think it would be a mistake to say, oh, we can put people into neat categories. Often it's a lot more complicated than that. But the key thing that you and I can extrapolate from this is that it's very easy to waver in our faith. You know, very easy to sort of move around. What's going to keep us grounded? What's going to keep us capable of really drilling down strong roots so that no matter what is thrown at us, our faith doesn't waver. We don't sort of move around, we don't become weak, atrophied and diminished. And to do that, to have those deep roots, it's always about drilling down into the richness of our tradition. And I think two things, as I've said to you before, prayer and study. When we are praying, it's, we are nourishing those roots. When we are praying, when we have an intimate relationship with God, those roots are strengthened. But we also have got to study. We've got to engage our minds. We've got to understand why and what Christ teaches what, is, what he teaches. Because as I say, the battle is really in the heart. There's such a tension in the heart. But what's going to resolve that tension is those firm roots of solid prayer and deep study. Now, when G.K. Chesterton, who's one of my great heroes, he made the daring step to convert to Catholicism as an Anglican in the last century. He tried to describe to his critics how that tension is manifest in everyone's hearts, particularly in the hearts of the critics of the church. He said, you know, he said it's impossible to actually be just to the Catholic Church. This is what he said. Because he said, the moment a person ceases to pull against it, you kind of feel this strange tug towards it, even when you're trying to be critical of it. In a strange way, he says, you can't really get away from it. You're always thinking about it. The moment someone stops shouting it down, you know, the moment you stop shouting at the church, for example, and just getting angry, the moment you begin to listen to it with pleasure, because you realize when you begin to listen to what the church actually teaches, those misunderstandings, those misapprehensions, and those poor judgments begin to fade. And he totally said, the moment one tries to be fair to it, the moment you begin to be fond of it. In other words, the more you understand, the more you fall in love. The more you fall in love, the more you do not waver in your faith. Now, Chesterton then said, it's one thing to say, you know, Catholicism, all right, it's good. It has a, it's a force for good in the world. But it's quite another thing then to conclude that it's right, that what it teaches is the truth. And do you know what he thought? The biggest obstacle 
for people coming to think that what the church teaches is right? What do you think the biggest obstacle is? You know, they've come so far, he thinks the last thing, the last stage that could stop someone coming to the faith, he said it's nothing to do with the enemies of the church, it's nothing to do with the world out there that will stop, the, stop someone converting to Catholicism. He said the one thing that might hold someone back is, I quote, the word of a Catholic. One foolish word from inside the church is, does far more harm than a hundred thousand negative words from outside the church. In other words, it can be our course and hearts, my course and heart in particular, that could be the cause of someone completely misunderstanding the gospel. But I would also say the reverse is true. One inspired word or action could be enough for someone out there to realize that what the church teaches is right. I'll give you one final example to conclude. Visiting the hospital, there was a lady there who was very sick. Not a, not, she was a young lady. She was very, very sick. And she saw me anointing the person in the next bed. And she shouts out to me, says, Father, do you know this priest, Father Amin? And I said, actually, I do. And she said, he converted me to Catholicism. He used to visit his mother in the nursing home where I worked. And I said, well, what, what did he do that brought you to the faith? And she said, well, he smiled at me. He smiled at me. I said, he smiled at you? She said, he, he had this glowing smile. You know, I could just see this man loved God, and I wanted what he had, and that was enough to bring that lady to the faith. We should not underestimate how significant something small like that could be for the salvation of someone else. So I pray that we will not overlook the opportunities that God sends us to help others to understand the truths of our faith more truly, that we will not shy away from speaking about our faith in public, that we will not be afraid to understand the intellectual beauty of our faith. But we can't give what we don't have. We can't show what we have not first seen ourselves. We cannot preach what we have not first heard. And so we must always strive to practice what we preach.